last but not least, <laughs> Laurent. Okay, so uh, this graph has, has a morphism problem. It's believed to be not polynomial time solvable in general, but it's also believed to not be an NP complete problem. So, not one of the hardest uh, uh, NP problems. Okay, so we are not going to focus on this one, but uh, this provides us uh, some context for our problem, which is graph alignment, which is a, a relaxed version of that. If you're given two graphs, you'd like to uh, see if they are near isomorph uh, isomorphic. So uh, what does that mean? Can you find a, a labeling of the nodes such that most of the edges get carried to uh, edges, most of the non-edges get carried to non-edges? Uh, so one way to formalize that is to minimize the number of disagreements between uh, uh, the adjacency uh, <coughs> on the starting graph and the adjacency at the uh, receiving graph. So uh, a one or a zero, you want it to be carried to a one or a zero and you count the number of disagreements and you minimize this number of disagreements over permutations of uh, uh, the names of the, of the nodes in, in the graph. So uh, this you can formalize as a minimization problem over uh, permutations and you mini, uh, you either minimize or maximize, depending on how you, you uh, construct your optimization problem. So you can view it as maximization of the trace of a product of four matrices. Uh, first matrix A is the adjacency matrix of the first graph. Pi is the uh, permutation matrix associated with one permutation in the symmetric group with N elements. A prime is the adjacency matrix of the second graph. And then pi transpose is again a, a permutation matrix, the transpose of the uh, uh, permutation matrix you're considering. So this is a permutation matrix associated with the inverse of, uh, of the permutation you're considering. And so you maximize that over the uh, permutation matrices and that will give you the best uh, alignment uh, the, the, that will minimize the number of disagreements, that will maximize the number of agreements uh, uh, between your two graphs for this uh, labeling, which is equivalent to a permutation. Okay, so that's what we want to solve. Uh, so it's got uh, many applications. I'll, I'll go quickly over that, but one application that's uh, uh, been quite uh, uh, well considered is that of the anonymization of social network data. So say you have uh, uh, one social network data where you know the uh, identities of the individuals and you have one where it's anonymized. If you can align the two graphs, then you can carry the identities from <clears throat> the non-anonymous data to the anonymized data and so you de-anonymize it. So it's a breach of privacy if you can succeed at uh, aligning graphs. Uh, so uh, there are other, uh, um, other uh, applications where you carry information. In the first example, it's carrying identities to an anonymous data set. So uh, you can also carry uh, information from a graph that say a mesh of the cortical surface of a brain and you may have a reference mesh that has been carefully annotated. You know this part of the mesh corresponds to that subset of the brain uh, area, so uh, the Broca area or whatnot. 
So if you have a new mesh of a, a patient's brain, say, you can align the two meshes and carry the information of one uh, to the other. So there are many such applications. I'll not dwell on that. Uh, and I'll uh, uh, jump right away into the, the setting uh, we consider for analysis. So we look at a synthetic uh, generative model for uh, correlated graphs in which we want to uh, solve this alignment problem. So we'll, uh, we love uh, Erdos-Rainy graphs, right? We've heard about them already. Uh, you even get to see the faces of Erdos and Rainy, so all is good. So uh, we, we are going to uh, consider correlated Erdos-Rainy graphs. How does that work? You take uh, uh, the same node set for two graphs, so the vertices numbered from one to n, okay? Uh, you construct a master graph, which has uh, edges present with a probability uh, P over S. So P is the probability of an edge being present in the end that you want to uh, target. S is a correlation factor. And now you do uh, two subsamplings of this master graph. You uh, keep edges uh, with probability S and you uh, remove them with probability one minus S. So you see that when you do one subsampling like that, you get an Erdos ring graph with parameter P for the presence of a probability, uh, uh, the probability presence of an edge. So you do that twice independently. But if S is large, you see that the presence of edges in the two graphs is correlated. So S captures <clears throat> this correlation. Uh, all right. And so you don't get to see these two graphs uh, as constructed from this downsampling procedure you uh, shuffle the names of the nodes in the second graph. And so the, the game is to uh, uh, deconstruct this uh, shuffling, so to find the, the uh, permutation that will realign the graphs uh, correctly, okay? So we know that the ground truth is this random uh, permutation that is a, a part of our generative model. Okay, uh, so, uh, a lot of work has been done recently uh, on this problem, and uh, um, <clears throat> the focus in the first words was to uh, recover exactly the unknown permutation given the two observed graphs. Uh, and so uh, in that setting, we know a lot. We know, for instance, uh, the exact condition on the parameters of the model. There are, there are two parameters, basically. There's the probability P of an edge being present in each of the graphs and S is the correlation parameter. So we know from the work of uh, uh, Kulina and Kavash that uh, it is possi possible information theoretically to recover this unknown permutation from the observed graphs uh, with high probability if and only if uh, the product NPS is log N plus something that grows with N, okay? If this is met, you can, by brute force, find the permutation. If this is not met, you, you have no means to, to recover it. Uh, then people have looked at the computational uh, uh, phase transition. Uh, so uh, under what conditions on the parameter does there exist a, a polynomial time algorithm that recovers the unknown permutation? So um, the results have, uh, uh, have uh, kept uh, arriving over the last two years, so the best that is known uh, to date is that there is a polynomial time algorithm that succeeds at recovering exactly the unknown permutation. If uh, uh, you have an average degree in your graph, so that's the product n times p, that is a uh, power of log n at least, okay? And if uh, the correlation parameter s is not too small, so it is uh, larger than some constant. So <clears throat> that's the latest and strongest result there is. And it's due to uh, Cheng Mao, Mark Rudelson, and, and uh, uh, third co-author. Uh, so uh, what we get from, in particular, the first point is that there is no way you can uh, recover the uh, permutation if the average degree in your graph is not logarithmic in n. You need at least uh, np uh, of order log n if there is any chance to recover the full uh, permutation. So. Uh, We'll focus on a, a harder regime, that is the sparse regime where the graphs have order one average degree, okay? And so there's no way we can recover the full permutation, but we'll uh, go for a, a less ambitious objective. We'll try to recover uh, a part of that permutation. So we'll say we're happy if 
we produce an estimated permutation that agrees with the unknown permutation on a, a non-vanishing fraction of the nodes. So that's what we might call the overlap between the true permutation and the one we produce. And so we want to uh, produce uh, uh, permutations from the observed graphs with non-vanishing uh, uh, overlap. So I'll first discuss results about uh, uh, the information theoretic feasibility or infeasibility of this task. And then I'll move on to the um, polynomial time feasibility of the task. Uh, OK, so uh, an impossibility result first. That's something we did with uh, uh, Marc Lelarge and our jointly uh, uh, mentored PhD student, Luca Ganasali, uh, last year. Uh, if the uh, product lambda times s is less than one, then we can show that uh, it's information theoretically impossible to uh, uh, even partially align the graphs. So maybe I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, how we get to, to such a result. So there's one concept which is a very important in studying this alignment problem. This is the concept of the intersection graph. So remember, we start with a master graph, okay? Uh, and we have edges in this master graph. And then uh, we downsample. And so we may keep the edges. So let's say I keep this edge in uh, G1. So A i j equals one. And I might also keep this edge in uh, the other uh, uh, downsampling procedure. So I don't know if that was a, a, a prime uh, ij, perhaps. So uh, for each such pair of nodes for which I have kept the two edges, I will say this is an edge of the intersection graph. OK, so this is just the collection of, of pairs of nodes for which the downsampling has preserved the edge uh, in both uh, in both operations of downsampling. All right, and so by construction, we know exactly uh, what this uh, uh, intersection graph is. We start with a, <coughs> an erdos rené graph with parameter uh, uh, G n vertices P over S, all right. Uh, we downsample uh, once to keep uh, one set of edges, so we go to G of NP, and then we uh, downsample a second time to uh, figure out whether we keep the, the edge in the other downsampling. So we eventually get to uh, uh, um, uh, Erdos Rennie graph with a modified parameter P times S for the probability of an edge being kept. And I realize I have not said what lambda is. I will take here P equals uh, lambda over n, so lambda will be uh, of order one, and this is the <coughs> average degree uh, in both our graphs, okay? So uh, when I'm saying uh, it's impossible to partially align the uh, uh, two graphs when lambda s is less than one, what I mean is that, uh, so <coughs> this is, uh, lambda s over n, and so uh, lambda s is the average degree in the uh, intersection graph. Okay, so uh, the uh, value one for the average degree of an erdos schrodinger graph is a critical uh, value. Uh, uh, it um, predicts a certain number of phase transitions that were actually the ones studied initially by Erdos and Reni back in 59 and in 60. So that was really the onset of the theory of random graphs. So uh, the first result in the theory of random graphs is that when the average degree of an Erdos Reni graph is below one, all connected components of the graph have, have number of nodes at most log n constant times log n, whereas if the average degree is above uh, one, then there is a giant component which takes a, a non-vanishing fraction of the nodes of order n. Um, so we know more actually about uh, uh, this phase transition. We know that below this phase transition, the uh, Erdos-Rennie graphs, so they have no giant components, 
but most of their nodes are in uh, trees. Okay, the, the uh, connected components will be uh, mostly uh, small trees. Okay, so uh, there's a vanishing uh, fraction of the nodes that goes into uh, uh, components that are not trees, but most of them are, are trees. And so we can leverage this uh, to show that indeed it is not possible when lambda s is uh, less than one to uh, partially align uh, the two graphs. Uh, so there is a construction, so I, I'll be very sketchy, but uh, maybe, uh, okay, let me try to give the, the gist of it. Uh, so what we do is uh, we uh, produce our uh, two uh, correlated graphs in uh, uh, several stages. First, we produce a candidate intersection graph, okay? So we know lambda is being less than one, that it consists mostly of uh, tiny uh, trees, of trees with order one nodes in it. So given such uh, uh, a random graph, we uh, uh, pick permutations of the node labels that are forced to, uh, you know, send, uh, preserve uh, this intersection graph structure. So for instance, I have a i j i prime j prime, and I could take sigma of i equals uh, i prime, sigma of i prime equals i, and so on and so forth. And so if I choose a permutation that shuffles uh, labels in such a way that those three components get preserved, okay, I have not messed up my, my uh, structure for the intersection graph. And uh, moreover, with some uh, uh, um, techniques of uh, so-called Poisson approximation, I, I can show that uh, I can do these constructions. So pick those sigmas, pick a number of them, a finite number of them, and then I can fill in the remaining edges and with a non-vanishing probability for each of these uh, permutations, I will not have created uh, extra edges in the intersection graph. So I, I could create an extra edge, for instance, if I have, okay, maybe this is in the intersection graph, I have i, j, I have i prime and j prime here. And let's say I have k here and I'll take uh, sigma of k equals k and then I'll uh, permute those guys. So eventually if I do the permutation and I had this originally, okay, so, I had one edge in the first graph from i to k and one edge in the second graph from i prime to k after the shuffling, I will get an extra edge in the uh, intersection graph. But this happens uh, with probability order one over n. And so uh, overall, the number of a new edge that I create is of order one. And I can use this Poisson approximation technique to show that with non-vanishing probability, I don't create such extra edges. So why is that interesting? Uh, it's interesting because uh, when that happens, I know that the distribution of the pairs of graphs that I uh, produce uh, after shuffling by this sigma or before, they will have the same distribution. They, they'll have the same law. So now I can say <clears throat> nature uh, follows this construction and decides afterwards which of these it chooses. Let's say I have done a number P of such uh, uh, constructions of pairs of correlated uh, graphs. These are the same graphs that you'll get to observe, but there's, uh, uh, there are P choices underlying this, which uh, uh, have uh, P different alignments and nature chooses one of these P alignments and you don't know which and they have a vanishing overlap between them. So in that case, you, you're doomed because uh, you'll try to make a guess, but you have no way to, you'll have a probability one over P to guess the right one. And if you don't guess the right one, you'll be off uh, on most of the vertices. So this is uh, how we, um, we establish this uh, impossibility of alignment uh, even partial alignment when we are below this critical threshold lambda s uh, less than one for the average degree in the intersection graph. Okay, uh, okay. So well, we we do a bit more with this kind of reasoning, but uh, let's let's not dwell on that. 
so what about uh, feasibility in an information theoretic sense? Uh, so uh, what we believe to be true is that we have the right threshold here and that when lambda s is larger than one, uh, one should be able to uh, align the graphs in a perhaps exponential time. But uh, uh, right now we can't prove that. What uh, is uh, known uh, for sure today is that if the product lambda s is larger than four, not one, then you can indeed uh, align the graphs uh, uh, in, uh, in exponential time. So, uh, the, the, uh, so the sharpest result is due to uh, Yi Hong Wu, Jamin Su, and Sophie Yu, uh, uh, who uh, have produced a number of results on this problem. So this is a, a recent paper from last year. Uh, and we had a, a worse constant uh, for the condition in, in a paper with Georgina Hall uh, a year before. So le let me just uh, give you uh, some of the ideas for the uh, feasibility result. Um, so this is going to be reminiscent of what I tried to explain about the uh, uh, existence of the hard phase for graph clustering. So we'll use essentially uh, what I call the first moment method. Uh, so we'll define a permutation to be good if after relabeling the nodes according to this permutation in the second graph, and uh, after counting the number of uh, 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 joint occurrences of edges in the two graphs, uh, having done this relabeling, I have a number of edges, of uh, co-occurrences of edges in the corresponding intersection graph, you might say, that is larger than uh, the number of no nodes and times some constant beta. So we know exactly the number of uh, edges in the uh, true intersection graph. It's going to be um, so the number of edges in the true intersection graph, basically it's the uh, one half of uh, n times the average degree in this uh, intersection graph. So we know that's, that's the target. We know this is achievable by some permutation. Uh, if we got the right permutation, we would have this uh, up to fluctuation terms. Uh, okay, and so we'll say we get a good permutation if we get uh, n times a beta that is uh, slightly less than lambda s over two, right? Um, and so the, the end of the argument, it, it's a parallel to the argument I was sketching for uh, uh, the existence of this hard phase in the graph clustering. We want to show that uh, any uh, permutation that, are, that is good in this sense is a permutation that achieves a, a non-vanishing overlap. And so uh, we follow the, the uh, uh, first moment method. We uh, compute the expected number of good permutations that, are, that uh, have a, an overlap below some uh, value gamma. And this is something that we, we, can, uh, we can explicit somehow. Um, so uh, it, it is, it is a, a lot of work still once you, you have uh, uh, gone that far. Uh, so uh, what is the, the remaining task? Uh, so for a given permutation, uh, you want to uh, control the probability that it produces uh, uh, an overlap that is uh, at least uh, gamma or at most gamma. And so uh, you have to deal uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, the random variables uh, X of, uh, uh, well, for a given permutation, you shuffle the uh, nodes so that the overlap is at most gamma, and then you fill in the edges. And so you want to compute the probability that uh, the permutation you produced is good. Okay, so this is the way in which you do the calculation. Uh, and maybe I, I, I should not dwell uh, uh, too much on this, but <clears throat> this is a delicate thing to, uh, to do. So for a given permutation uh, with a, a bounded overlap, you need to uh, show that the corresponding number of uh, uh, common edges uh, is uh, with high probability below uh, n beta. Uh, and so you try to use a Chernoff style bound. 
but uh, you don't have uh, in this summation over over edges you don't have a, su a sum of our independent components however if uh, uh, if you carefully put the components together in this sum you you, you may uh, end up with uh, things that are independent so the, the construction is delicate uh, and I should not spend too much time on it. So, but that's that's uh, how you get to uh, uh, to a feasibility results. And so, uh, really, this is a, a, a delicate evaluation. And I guess this is why we are at, at right now. We get a condition lambda s larger than four. And I think that if we uh, were a bit uh, more. Uh, careful in this line of argument, maybe we, we would catch the right condition, which is lambda s uh, strictly larger than one, okay? So uh, that's a conjecture and we're not too far on the uh, exact boundary for uh, information theoretic feasibility. So uh, I, I'll move to uh, po uh, polynomial time feasibility, unless you have questions of, uh, on what I've uh, told so far. Maybe I'm a bit just tired, but uh, if, if I want to show that feasibility results, I want to show that there are good uh, permutations, right? Yes. So, no, you, what you want to, well, you know there are good permutations because you know that the true permutation you're looking for is going to be good with high probability. So okay. you know there are good permutations. What you want to show is that no good permutation produces a poor overlap. So no. the way that you do it is uh, you will sum over permutations with a poor overlap and you will uh, show that the probability that okay. any such permutation is good is tiny and you must show that it is so tiny that after summing over all such uh, okay. permutations with poor overlap you get something that is uh, still tiny. Okay. So this is in this way that it goes. I understand. Okay. Right, so let's, uh, let's uh, now move to, um, to polytime uh, partial alignment of graphs in this model. Uh, so uh, what's going on on this? Uh, well, you, you should see on the screen the region, uh, or maybe you see it, but no. It's a very light blue, the region where... Uh, <coughs> You see it on that one. On that one, it's even better. Yes, that's the <laughs> that's the conjectured information theoretic boundary. So we have right. We have lambda. This is the average degree in the graphs that we get to observe. We have s. That's the correlation parameter between zero and one. Okay, so lambda s uh, less than one is uh, well. We get uh, we will start things at one, so we get something like that. This is lambda s equals one, and we believe that the the information theoretic limit is uh, uh, given by this line. So we'll uh, start, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> carving out of this uh, uh, feasibility region a polynomial time feasibility region. Uh, so first with this result. Uh, so this result will tell us that there is a, a, a triangle, it, it exists, it has non-empty interior. It is not big, but it exists. And we'll improve that uh, as, uh, as I proceed. Uh, so we have one polynomial time algorithm, which uh, uh, I'll describe in a minute, uh, which succeeds at polynomial time uh, uh, alignment in this tiny uh, rectangle of the uh, triangle. So we have the of the uh, uh, phase space. And this is the so-called neighborhood tree matching algorithm. And this is again something we, so that's something uh, uh, I did with uh, uh, Luca Ganassali, uh, the PhD student I already uh, mentioned. Uh, okay, so let me describe a little bit uh, this algorithm. So the first thing I need in order to describe it is this notion of a tree matching weight. So tree matching weight for us is the following thing, given two trees that are rooted, okay? Uh, uh, if I uh, give myself a depth, candidate depth D, 
then the tree matching weight of the two rooted trees is the maximal number of leaves at depth D that I get in a tree that I can uh, uh, write in both of them. So I can find a tree that is a subtree of each of them, and uh, I count its leaves. And so the maximal number of such leaves is for me the uh, uh, tree matching weight between the two. So that's what I'll use uh, in this algorithm. Uh, so first remark is that you can compute that recursively. So this is something that is uh, amenable and into to uh, reasonable uh, computations. So if I have uh, those two trees, if I want to compute this uh, uh, weight, what I'll do is I'll look at all matchings of the children of the two roots. I'll uh, uh, start from the uh, tree matching weights to depth d minus one of the corresponding pairs of uh, rooted trees. Uh, so for any matching, I sum that, I, I get uh, a candidate value. If I maximize over the matchings of the children of the two roots, I get my matching weight. So that's amenable to a recursive computation. Okay, so what do I do with that in order to produce an algorithm? Uh, well, uh, here's the general idea. Uh, I would uh, consider uh, any node i in the first graph G1, uh, any node u in the second graph uh, G2, look at their neighborhoods to some distance d, okay? If these neighborhoods are trees, in general, this is the, the neighborhoods in uh, uh, sparse Erdos-Rheny graphs uh, are tree-like. So I know this will happen most, for most pairs of nodes. So if these are trees, I'll compute the tree matching weight of the two neighborhoods, and I'll take a large matching weight as a sign that these uh, nodes are good candidates to be matched. Okay? Uh, and so I would want to produce a matching that consists of pairs that have a, a large matching weights when I, I, I consider their uh, neighborhoods. So this is not quite sufficient uh, because uh, we intuitively, you know that if you have a correct match, okay, the neighborhoods are correlated in a way that you understand quite well. And so uh, you'll have a large matching weight, but if uh, you take, so in uh, your uh, uh, construction of the master graph before shuffling and when you do the two down samplings, okay, if I consider two nodes in this graph that point uh, in G1 for I and in G2 for U uh, to a common node, if there is a large ma matching weight between the two uh, uh, neighborhoods for the common node, they point two, then I and U will also uh, inherit a large matching weight. So this is not... Um, sufficient, I need to filter out false positives, okay? So there, there's a, a, an easy way to do that that we, we uh, developed. We call the dangling tree algorithm. So uh, dangling tree trick, sorry. Uh, so instead of declaring that node I and node U are uh, candidates for a match if the neighborhoods have a large matching weight, tree matching weight, I'll ask that uh, for each of the two nodes, I can uh, uh, identify two neighbors. So uh, JJ prime for I and uh, VV prime for uh, U, such that uh, the tree that is dangling from uh, J in uh, G1 and the tree that is dangling from uh, V in G2 have large matching weights. And similarly for uh, J prime and uh, V prime. And so uh, thanks to that, I, I can work around this, these false positives. So I, I, I have more or less the same philosophy for the algorithm, but I need to introduce that to get rid of false positives. And uh, that's, that's what we do. So, so I, I guess if you do that, you reduce the probability of false positive. And if you want to reduce even more, you could look at the dangling trees, which are connected to the nodes connected the we, we could go down that, that way actually okay. actually what, what we uh, so if you just uh, take this algorithm you need a, a couple of technical lemmas to show that things work but if you uh, uh, change this to three dangling trees yeah. rather than two uh, it's uh, the proofs get much simpler so that's what we follow in the end uh, our proof strategy we use three dangling trees for each uh, uh, node, and we need uh, three 
uh, high weights for uh, uh, three uh, three matchings uh, in order to uh, qualify a pair IU as a uh, as a candidate match. Yes. Yes, yes. You know that you will miss out many uh, good matches if, so, the, if the degree is low. I repeat the question. If <laughs> I repeat the, just the question. Yes, so you, you do have uh, proper matches that are even isolated nodes, and so they, the matching weights are going to be zero. So uh, these you'll never get. Uh, but since we are after a partial alignment, so we would be uh, glad if we matched correctly 10% of the nodes, say. Uh, indeed, we will never get 100% in that regime. Especially for isolated nodes, there is no way you can tell uh, that they are. And in Erdos-Rémy uh, graphs, you get a sizable fraction of nodes that have degree zero. So you're doomed for those, uh, so indeed. Okay, so the details of the algorithm are as follows. You, uh, you have a, a depth uh, that you use in the computation of the uh, matching weights that is logarithmic in the number of nodes. Okay, so that's what will work. Uh, and uh, you uh, <coughs> pick a, a threshold for the weights that I'm, I'm going to describe. It's going to be uh, exponential in this depth, okay? Uh, and so uh, two nodes uh, IU such that you have two dangling uh, pairs uh, with a high uh, matching weight uh, are added to a set of, uh, of uh, potential matches. Uh, and um, what happens, I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, intuition for why this is the case. What happens is that uh, for each, <coughs> um, for, uh, there's a, a non-vanishing fraction of nodes in the graph uh, G1, such that you can find, uh, uh, such that the correct match uh, is uh, identified in this procedure. So we, we will get a sizable fraction of the correct matches in this procedure. Uh, and uh, the number of nodes in G1, such that you, you do match them to uh, more than, to a, a non-incorrect, uh, 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 node that has a, a, a vanishing fraction of the nodes. So this is what we can prove. And so uh, massaging this list of potential matches, we, we can produce a, a permutation that we know will achieve a, a, a non-vanishing overlap. Uh, so a few words about the, uh, okay, a few words about uh, how we get to, to that result. So uh, first thing that we need to uh, uh, work on is uh, uh, understand the uh, matching weight when you have two uh, uh, nodes that are very far apart in the graph. So one thing I mentioned uh, uh, previously is that the neighborhood of a node in an Erdos-Rémy graph is close to a, a branching uh, uh, process so in, uh, more specifically, a Galton-Watson branching process with a low for the number of children in each individual that is Poisson distributed with. So uh, then if you try to match two nodes that are very far in this master graph originally, uh, the neighborhood in G1 looks like a, a branching uh, a process, Galton-Watson process, and the neighborhood in G2 of the other guy is again uh, like a, a Galton-Watson branching process, and they tend to be uh, independent, okay? So we need to understand uh, how large a weight we produce if we consider two uh, independent Galton-Watson branching trees. So that's the first thing we, we do. Uh, and uh, so you, you can, uh, uh, by induction on the depth, uh, uh, get probabilistic bounds on those matching weights. And you have two independent branching uh, uh, trees. And we can show that with high probability, the uh, matching weight of two Galton-Watson branching processes that are independent, that have a, a, a average number of uh, children that is between one and some uh, not so large number lambda note, this grows uh, like a constant gamma uh, 